Nina. Thank you very much. What we really need now is a copy of Lessons in Tanya, Volume 5. Can someone go downstairs and bring it up? Yeah. Volume 5. Is it on your desk? On my desk is Volume 1. And the reason is because at the end of Chapter 2, we learned that the, the neshama is part of God. The garments of the, of the neshama, however, through which the neshama expresses itself, they come from the, the mindset and the feelings of the mother and father when they conceive the child. So therefore, we want to prepare ourselves in holiness for the honor and privilege of being able to have children. Yaira is on, online. Good morning. Chaya Atkins is in her place. Good morning, Chaya. Hannah Nira is Nina is fetching of uh, Tanya. Please. Leah is in her seat. She likes sitting there. Shoshana Hossid, I saw downstairs. Malka is Malka here. Let's see, Rachel. Good morning, Rachel O'Connor. Mrs. Shapiro. Mm -hmm. Evan Sapir. Sapphires. The, the Ten Commandments were given on sapphire stones. I like the sapphire. And Rochel Hana. What did you say? I said I like sapphires. You like sapphires. You have a natural connection to them. We got it? Okay, good. Yeah, this is the one. Volume five. Yeah. Why did I ask for this? Because we were we were saying that since the Nefesh Ruach and Hashem express themselves through garments of thought, speech, and action. And these garments come from the mother and father. So it can happen that the soul of a very, very great tzaddik could come to be reincarnated in the life of somebody from a very, very simple, poor family with no education whatsoever. And I was telling you the story about Reb Zusha of Anipol, who writes the introduction to the Tanya, that he was from such a family. We said the bracha downstairs. And in the Tanya that we read these days, these particular days, this is called divine providence. Hashkacha protis, a friend of mine calls it Hashkacha proteins. We read it, a story. There's, here's a story in the middle of the Tanya here, <coughs> which is exactly on topic, exactly what we're talking about. So I'm going to read you, I want to read you this story. Yeah. It says here, the Rebbe, the Alter Rebbe writes about the Torah that's learned, how we learn Torah. What happens to it? Malka, hello. Malka. What happened to Shoshana? She was here. She said hello to me. Now she didn't make it. Okay. So it speaks about Torah. When a person learns Torah for a, a reason, he has a personal selfish reason. He wants to learn Torah. I remember reading a story about a certain person who learned Torah because he, he grew up in such poverty that he knew the only way he was going to get out of this situation a couple of hundred years ago was if he would sit and make himself learn so hard 
that he would be recognized as a potential scholar, they would take him up. The, 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 the families with money would support his learning and want to marry him off to their daughter because everybody wants their daughter to marry a scholar, a scholarly person. Nowadays, this becomes that the, comes out that parents want their children to go to the best kindergarten so that they'll get into Yale and Harvard 20 years down the line. So that's called learning Torah for the wrong reason. Learning Torah in order to be, become a rabbi. I remember I hear, heard a conversation about a very great Hasid, Reb Hillel of Parich. As a young man, he became attracted to the, the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov, and he, he left his yeshiva. And he went to learn in a yeshiva where they would learn Hasidus. And he met his old teacher, and his teacher said, why did you leave? And he said, I learned, I, I left because there they learned Hasidus. I wanted to learn Hasidus. And I wanna ask you a question. When was the last time that you were thinking about Hashem? He says, I think about Gomorrah, he says, that's why I left. Because there they think about Hashem. They teach you about Hashem. So he, he learned and learned and learned, and he went home for Pesach. His Rosh Hashiva told him, it's Pesach, you have to go home, you have to honor your parents. You have to go home for Pesach. He came home, his father said, did you visit the Rav? You have to visit the Rav of the, of the community. So he didn't really want to go to visit the Rav, but his, out of respect for his father, he went. So the Rav said to him, what's it like? What's it like in, in, in Lubavitch? What is this Rab, Rebbe all about? He said, oh, he's a, he's a great genius. And then, so then the Rav had a question. Does he have a cow? That was his question. Does he have a cow? Because in those days, if you had a cow, you had milk. You had food, you had cheese. So if a person would want to learn Torah to become a rabbi, because if you are become a rabbi, the community is going to give you a house and give you a cow. That's called learning not for the right reason. Learning for the right reason is called lishma, to learn for the sake of Hashem. You learn Torah because it's Hashem's Torah. Hashem is in the Torah. I want to be, that's, that's where I want to be. Okay, that's called learning lishma. So then the question is asked, and this is what he's dealing with here in the Tanya. What does it mean <clears throat> if I don't learn? If I learn lishma, so it says in the Zoyar, a person who davens or learns not lishma for the sake of an ulterior motive, for the sake of gain, so that he'll get a good shidduch or he'll make his way ahead in the world or people will respect him because he's able to give a good speech. That Torah is cast back down. It doesn't go up. It doesn't get up into holy realms. You follow me? When we learn Torah, the words that we learn go up. They go up into Gam Eden. And they are kept there. They are holy words. They are words directed to Hashem. But if I'm thinking about getting a Lexus, then the words don't go up anywhere. If I'm thinking about getting a house in the mountains for the summer, the words don't go anywhere. If that's what I'm learning for, so that's called learning for, not for the wrong reason. If a person learns for the right reason, the words go up to very high places, high chambers in higher worlds. What if a person just learns, not for any particular reason and not for a bad reason. He just learns, oh, I'm Jewish, I learn. Sort of like a deep natural inclination. That's going to be called in the Tanya, your natural love of Hashem. This is Rivka, right? Yes. Rivka Ram. Yes. Okay. So it says there in the Zohar, this is no worse than little children learning in Cheder, reciting comments, Aleph, oh, oh, 
commerce based ball, they're not thinking of personal gain and they're not thinking about Hashem either. They're just they're doing what their teacher asks them to do. They're learning how to read. So this is very precious to Hashem. Why? Because there's no ulterior motive here. There's no filthy ego involved in their learning. And that's precious to Hashem. That's what's special about the, the, the voice of little children, which is free of sin. That's very precious to Hashem. A friend of mine was once standing in 770 by the elevators. You know, when you come in, there's an elevator there outside the Rebbe's door. 770 used to be a doctor's office. So you'd come in from Eastern Parkway, and then you'd go up to the doctor's office. He had an elevator to the third floor. He was standing in front of the This friend of mine was standing in front of the elevator by Mincha time, and the Rebbe came out. <clears throat> And he gave nickels to all the children who were there waiting for him. And he watched as they put the nickel in the pushka with great interest. Now, this friend of mine was, was Shmerl, his name is Shmerl Katzen, Oliver Shalom, passed away a few years ago. A great, he was a great Balchuba, a great, wonderful, dedicated teacher of little children. And he was standing beside a man who was obviously a stranger in 770. He wasn't used to coming. For whatever reason, he had come. And he saw this, and he was wondering the whole time, why is the Rebbe, a great scholar, wasting so much precious time that he could be learning Torah, giving coins to little children? The Rebbe didn't say anything to him. The Rebbe went in and David Mincha. And then after Mincha, the Rebbe came out. And as he passed by, my friend and this newcomer, how could he tell he was a newcomer? He didn't have a beard. He didn't, wasn't wearing a hat. You know. He wasn't wearing the Lubavitch costume. And as Rebbe passed by, he didn't break step. He said, we have, what we have, he said in Yiddish, what we have here is the breath of children that's free of ch sin. What we have here is the tzedakah of children that's free of sin. Very precious. Okay. Now, page 290. In volume five, it says in the Gemara, in the name of Reish Lokish, Reish Lokish, the famous character in the Gemara, he was an, uh, a thief. He was a powerful person. And one time he saw a beautiful woman in a, in a pool of water and desired her. And he had so much strength in him, he leaped across the water to get to her and discovered it wasn't a woman, it was a man. who <coughs> was a very, very beautiful sage. And he said, with your beauty, you should have been a woman. And he said, with your strength, you should have been a Torah scholar. <laughs> and that got to him and Taka, he became a Baal Shuva, and he learned so deep, he became one of the outstanding sages of the Talmud. And he says, the world exists solely in the virtue of the breath that comes from the mouths of little children in Cheder learning olive base. And, and Rab, Rab Papa said to Abaya when he heard this, and what about my Torah? What about your Torah? And Rapapa said, and, uh, and Abaya said to him, you can't compare the breath of children that knows no sin to breath of a person who has, who knows what sin is. This means that the children are not in the category of people who do, uh, do, do sins because they're, they're little children. They're not capable of doing sins. They, even if they do something wrong, and they don't do it as, as a sin. They do it because they just they're little children. So the previous Rebbe, that's our Rebbe's father-in-law, the Friedrich Rebbe, once recalled that when his father, the Rebbe Rashab, whose birthday was a couple of weeks ago, right? When he taught him this Gemara, he explained that what happens when a person learns Torah is that angels elevate the Torah study 
And the Torah study of these children goes up to the highest level of the highest world. And this is uh, uh, like the 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 the, 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 the the wonderful mystics who occupy themselves with supernal unions in godliness and refine themselves physically, refine their physical body according to the secrets of the Kabbalah. And this, so they get to the level, and the, the, yet the little children whose breath is free of sin is on the same high, very high level when they learn Kometz Aleph A, Kometz Beis Ba, and so on, because they believe with a simple and ingrained faith And the very breath that they say emanates from their hearts and it's utterly pure. Okay. Now, the Rebbe Rishab, based on this, told a story about the Baal Shem Tov that he heard from his father. That when the Baal Shem Tov <clears throat> uh, the Rebbe Rishab heard this from the Rebbe Maharash, that's the Rebbe Shmuel, when he one time went to the resting place of the Baal Shem Tov in Mezhebush, and the Baal Shem Tov appeared to him, and the Baal Shem Tov, you hear this, girls? Yeah. The Baal Shem Tov came to him in Mezhebush and told him the following story, that on the 16th birthday, when the Baal Shem Tov was 16 years old, he was still an unknown personality. He found himself in a small village. And the local innkeeper was an unlettered, uneducated, simple person. He barely knew how to read the prayers, let alone understand them. He did not understand the prayers either. But he was a very God-fearing person. And everything that he did, and at all times, he would say in, in Lashon HaKadosh, Baruchu uvaruch shemei. Ask him how you are. It's a baruchu uvaruch shemei. Fine, thank you. And his wife too would always also say in Yiddish, "Dank dem Abishtin, a thank to the Abishtas. So that day, in accord, according to the age-old custom, which is even written about in Hayyim Yim, that on a person's birthday he should spend time in solitude and think about where he's holding in his service of Hashem. So the Baal Shem Tov himself, who was an orphan now for uh, over 10 years, at the age of 16, he went off into the fields to meditate. And he began reciting chapters of Tehillim. And as he's reciting the chapters, he's thinking about how the names of Hashem, the Dov of the Melech, wrote in the Tehillim, because Tehillim is very, is, is prophecy. We don't realize it. The holy chapters of Tehillim are, are very, very deep mystical things going on in them. And, uh, and, and at the tzaddikim, who know these secrets, that's what they think about when they say Tilim. I'll give you an example. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a guy here in Crown Heights, Rabbi Galertner, who used to sell hats. One time I went to him and bought a hat. And he told me, that he had a friend named Rabbi Friedman. Rabbi Friedman is another story. I can't get into that. I'm going to get into too many stories, but yeah. <laughs> but Rabbi Friedman was a, a, a special student of the Chofetz Chaim. Famous Chofetz Chaim who started this whole campaign about that all the troubles in the world come from people saying bad things. And that causes bad vibes and bad angels and and, and causes hatred and uh, people, period and all is people not respecting each other and saying lush and horror about each other. This brings all kinds of bad, bad events upon the Jewish people. So that was Chavetz Haim. He was his top student. So this Rabbi Friedman told him that if a person needs a house, he's desperately looking for a house, he should read the 84th chapter of Tehillim. Chapter 84 in Tilim, it says in there, every bird knows its home. 
So we also have to know that our home is with the Abishta. Because every bird knows, knows, knows its nest. And Rabbi, and, and Rabbi Galerner, who told me this, he chuckled, because he was very friendly with this Rabbi Friedman. Rabbi Friedman hardly spoke, but he used to speak to him. And he said, Rabbi Friedman, he was a Jew who knew what was going on in Tehillim. That's what he said. He was a Jew who knew what was going on in Tehillim. And if you need a house, then you should recite this chapter 84. And I've told this to a number of people. I passed this message along to people who told me they were searching in for a house and they couldn't find it, couldn't find. And I told them this <clears throat> idea that I'd heard from Rabbi Galerner, who heard it from Rabbi Friedman, who was this, the number one student of the Chovetz Chaim. And so they started doing it. And guess what? They got a house. So this is what the, the Baal Shem Tov was going to do. He was going to the fields on his 16th birthday, and he was saying to Hillim, and he was thinking about the meanings and the, the unifications of the, of the different names of Hashem that are to be found in the Tehillim. And he was working very hard at it. And he says, he, he now the Baal Shem Tov came to the Rebbe Rashab, no, to the Rebbe Maharash, who told this to the Rebbe Rashab. He came to him when he visited his resting place in Mezhabuj. Now, nowadays, people go there. Every year, a couple of times, there are trips, excursions that go to see the holy places of all the tzaddikim in Ukraine. Baal Shem, Mezhabuj is in Ukraine. Yes. And, and they go there and they pray and they, they, with their requests. And they go to visit the Rebbe's father, and they go to visit all the other great, many of the other great tzaddikim that we mentioned, Rebbe Zusha Anipol, Rebbe Eli Melech of Lezhinsk, Rebbe Levi Yitzchak Bardichev, I'm in Ukraine, and just full, chock-a-block, full of holy, holy, holy people. And the Baal Shem Tov, so, so the, my Rebbe Maharash is there by the, the uh, Oihel, by the oil of the Baal Shem Tov, and the Baal Shem Tov appears to him. And he tells him this story that when he was 16 years old, he was sitting in, there in, in, in on a tree stump or whatever, saying to Hillim, totally unaware of my surroundings, and I suddenly saw Elijah the prophet. This is the Baal Shem Tov talking now. The Baal Shem Tov says he saw Elijah the prophet on his 16th birthday, and there was a smile. He was smiling, and I was shocked. Because when I had been together with the Tzaddik Reb Meir, I think he's one of the hidden Tzaddikim, and also when I had been in the, in the company of other hidden Tzaddikim, I had merited then on those occasions to see Elijah. Because I was with them. He came to them and I was there, so I also saw. But this was the first time in my life that I had merited ever to see Elijah the prophet when I was all alone. And I wondered, why is this happening? And why was he smiling? And so Eliyahu said to me, you are working so hard and was so strenuously to have the proper intentions in your mind as you are saying the holy names of Hashem in the Tehillim. And, but your, the innkeeper, Aaron Schleimer, and his wife, Zlata Rivka, they don't know about these, these things. They don't know about these Yehud, about the unifications of the names of God that come. For, for, for. But you should know that when he says Baruch Hu the whole day long, and she says Abishtin the whole day long, every sentence, you know, there are people like that. My wife's grandmother, she says she didn't say a sentence. A, 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 a woman from Morocco. She didn't say a sentence without the name of God in it. But these holy harmonies that they create with their Baruch Hashem and Dante Mebishten, they resonate in all the heavens much more than all the unifications of holy names that you are thinking about when you say Tehillim. And Eliyahu described, Eliyahu Anovi described to me, says the Baal Shem Tov to the Rebbe Maharash, the great pleasure that this caused in heaven from the words of praise and adoration 
authored by the men and women and children, especially the children, that come from the mouths of these simple people who have no selfish, egotistical motives in praising Hashem. Just it's a natural love and fear of Hashem. And most especially when these praises are offered consistently over and over and over again, for then these people are constantly united with Hashem in pure faith and with undivided hearts. So I read this to you as Hashkocha Protest. This is the Tanya for today. This story is in the Tanya we were today, and I read it this morning. I said, wow, we we're just talking about this in class. Yeah. Ashkocha proteins. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that just what we're talking about? No, yeah. That no, that it says the holiness of the soul is a holy soul, but the garments of the soul come from the parents. And that's why sometimes we find very, very great and lofty souls in the lives of simple, uneducated people. Because the the Aaron Shlomo of the story and and, 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 and his wife Zlata Rivka, probably generations before them, they had very, very holy parents, but who knows what happened to them? Did they pass away in poverty or were they killed in a pogrom? Who knows what holy what holy background they have? And they just they were just born not with the intellect or the feelings of a, a but, but with the natural inclinations to, to, to holiness, which is so precious to Hashem. So we read, we read the story as a gloss, as an explanation of what it says at the end of chapter two, that that's why the sages say we have to be very careful and pay attention to the children of the poor because very sometimes great Torah will come out from them. And also that what he says that, that uh, while the neshama is very, very holy, it sometimes happens that a great neshama will come down <clears throat> into uh, the life of a person who, who you never, ever expected. And even says in a different note that I saw one time that this is, it could happen, that a great person, you have a great person, a great scholar, and some are greatly knowledgeable, and for some reason the Yitzhahar traps him and gets him involved in all kinds of a mess and he abandons his Yiddishkeit. He's angry at God, angry at the Jewish community. And sometimes they rise in power. The Goyim give them power. And they, they do terrible things to the Jewish community. And they do many, many transgressions. So they're really becoming slaves to the Yetzirah. They become enslaved. They get trapped they, and they can't even get, get free. They can't free themselves. Their actions are so bad that they, they can't free themselves. And, and the Yetzirah has a hold of them now, so to speak. And he writes there, and in, in, in here in the Tanya, he tells a story, he, a commentary. And he says, sometimes we can't understand why, but the Yetzirah will let that neshama loose. And he'll let that neshama, which is a very high neshama, which has been stuck in the mud of, of sin, in the, in the clutches of the Yetzirah spiritually, and to let it go to be born into this world in the hope that since it's a neshama that did so many transgressions, and it's such a powerful neshama, it will become an even greater sinner in this, in this incarnation. And this is how sometimes a person could be a very big sinner, a very wicked person, and have a child who becomes a big tzaddik. Or it could be a very simple person, an unlettered person, who's not going to give his child a Jewish education, so he won't know how to do learn Torah, he won't know how to do mitzvahs. And this soul of a great tzaddik who was in, uh, sunk in sin in a previous incarnation can be born into this family, and things can happen, and he'll do tshuva. So that's the end of chapter two. And we still didn't finish telling the story about, uh, uh, about the parents of Reb Zusha and Reb Eli Melech. But since we only have a few minutes left, I'll just give you a hint that one time 
the Baal Shem Tov was traveling around incognito in disguise as an ordinary person. And he stops in the marketplace and he starts talking to people and telling them stories. And he tells a story from the Talmud about a rich man who was bringing a big fat ox to Yerushalayim to offer as an offering of thanksgiving to Hashem. And from this ox, there's, there's going to be a lot of meat and they're, he's going to have a big feast, a barbecue, and <clears throat> all his family and his extended family and his friends, they're going to have a big feast like on Pesach, you know, a, a, a family celebration. And he's going to Yerushalayim and this ox is beautiful, big and strong and handsome, and the ox doesn't want to go. And he can't pull it. It's too strong. He doesn't know what to do. He can't hit it. If he hits it, he give it a, 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 if it breaks the skin, it's blemished. Can't offer a blemished animal on the, uh, on the altar of God. He's really stuck. So the whole procession, the whole family, they're stuck in the road. Like a, they got a flat tire. And along comes a simple person. He can't afford an ox. He can't afford a sheep. He can't afford a goat. He can't even afford flour. Well, he can barely afford to bring a matzah. So he's got this bundle of wheat that he's going to take to Yerushalayim. And he's going to have the wheat prepared and separated and ground up into flour. And from the flour, they're going to make matzahs. And that's going to be his poor man's offering of thanksgiving to Hashem for whatever he has. And he sees the problem they're having. He thinks, I could help. You know, <laughs> he's a very rich guy. And who am I? I'm a nobody. But I could help him. How do you help him? I've got this wheat. Oxen like to eat wheat. So he gives them a little some wheat to nibble on. And the ox moves. And he, in this way, he gets the ox to, to start moving. And everybody's happy. But then he needs a little bit more. He has to give him some more and a little bit more. And this way, little by little, he gets the ox to Yerushalayim for them. And with a little, with a little bit of wheat that he's got left over, he makes a matzah, and that's his offering to Hashem. And the rich man brings his big ox, and they have a big feast, and everybody's happy. But a voice comes out from heaven. There's a story in the Talmud, and there's a story that this person, this hidden tzaddik, is telling in the marketplace that a voice comes out from heaven that the, what the poor man did with his wheat, helping these other Jews to bring their offering to Hashem was much more precious than the grateful feast of the rich man with all his family. It was much more appreciated and much more precious in the eyes of Hashem. And <clears throat> amongst the listeners, was this person who heard the story and he went home. He was a poor water carrier. He earned his living carrying heavy buckets of water to his customers. And he had good customers. They used to pay him. And there was another water carrier in town who didn't have such good customers. He used to bring <laughs> water to the yeshiva and they didn't always pay. They didn't have money. And, and he knew he had a better route. And he said, you know, I wish, I wish that I could be like that poor man. How I wish that I could serve Hashem like he did. And he says to his wife, you know, I have an idea. I'm going to switch routes with the other water carrier and ask him if he wants my route and I'll take his. And she approved. And so he did it. The other water carrier, when he told him the next day in shul, he wants to switch routes, he thought he'd gone crazy. So you crazy? You want to give me your route and take mine? Yeah, that's what I want. Gladly, he says, I'll be glad. I'll be glad to switch with you. And they switch. And then shortly after that, guess what? The Malamid comes and tells him, you know, your boy, Zusha, he doesn't learn so good. I think he's catching on. We can keep him. 
he can continue learning. Remember, I told you, you better get him a profession. Let him keep learning another year. We'll see, we'll see what happens. And that's how they made a big breakthrough. Through his kindness and year Shemaim and generosity. <laughs> anyway, that's what's behind this whole idea that great Torah can come from simple people and simple people can be endowed with very great souls. And the, the, the Friedrich Rebbe tells this whole story. And what's really behind the whole story is that the parents, the orphan parents of Reb Zusha and Reb Elimelech were in fact descended from hidden tzaddikim who died in poverty. Nobody knew who they were until they passed away. And then they discovered the, like all these writings and chidush Torah and things that nobody ever dreamed that they even knew anything. And these were their orphan children. The community married off to two orphans. The two orphans themselves had never had much education, but they, they had this natural love and fear of God and the holy children that they bore became leaders of the Jewish people for all generations. L'chaim. You can read that whole story in the memoirs of the previous Rebbe. What? I have to read books of the memoirs. You have three? Yeah, all three. All three? Yeah. Okay. So it's a really good book. I'm reading a little bit every day. Who has a question? Yeah, me. Oh. Uh, the story about the dealing. Because the story about the dealing, how we got connect, so connected, the Bashem talked to the dealing. But how can we get connected to the dealing? We have no, like, so much. We have to, we're simple people. We just have to re read till him with simple faith and and just try to say the words properly. And we have to, but we have to know that we're doing something very, very holy. Um, and you'll be sitting saying till him on Shabbos Mavorchim for who knows how many hours. And, and people who, uh, who grow up learning from an early age, they say the whole tillim in an hour and an hour and a half. How do they do it so fast? But you know what? According to the story, you understand that uh, 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 Hashem doesn't count the number of pages that you say. Every word is precious. But what you could try to do, it's a big, huge project, but to take a few lines of Tehillim every day, try and recite the daily shear, the, at least one chapter of Tehillim after, you, after your davening, whatever your davening is, to say one chapter of Tehillim, <laughs> take a short one and you say it, or say that uh, at least a few lines of a chapter connected with the years of your life. Like if you're 19, so you say chapter 20, 22, you say chapter 23, and so on. And uh, you should know that you're connecting, you're saying the words of David Amelech. And whenever, here's another idea for you, that whenever we learn <coughs> an idea from Torah, the person who taught that idea says the words together with us because he revealed this Torah in the world. And when we repeat that Torah, his lips move, even though he may be in the grave. But his, who says his body is his decay, his lips move together with you when you say, so that means when you say to him, Dovah the Melod is saying to him together with you. And you think of that, when you say to him, Hashem doesn't expect more than that. That's already a lot. Excuse me, Rabbi Faith. Um, Ms. Nemi's not here, so she has to do Okay. Join uh, Rabbi Majestic class. Okay, go to Rabbi Majestic. Yes, Leah. Today, indeed, it is also good to read the, like, at the beginning of the new month. Today, indeed, we need to read the, like. What? Well, I can't hear you there. The acoustics in the room are so bad yes. that the sound echoes, and I can't make up what you're saying. I have two questions. Yeah. Um, 
Mm-hmm. What? Today, even when you say, Yes, In the evening, at night? Yes. At, ni- at night, after dark, we don't say to you. After midnight, we say to you. But if it's Rosh Kodesh, no exception. Yeah, no, no, no. Not at night. But, I mean, unless it's an emergency or in the hospital with somebody, you could say Tilim, but uh, ge- generally at night, even Shabbos, we don't say Tilim at night. Shabbos. 